which tonight our program is the history of Eudora area communities. Uh, the uh, Eudora area is home to several what we call smaller communities, sometimes called ghost towns, which are Clearfield, Fall Leaf, Prairie Center, Hesper, and Weaver. Uh, I think it's important to remind people that our organization is not called the Eudora Historical Society, it's the Eudora Area Historical Society, because that means we care just as much about the, the other smaller communities on that, on that map as we do about the city of Eudora itself. So obviously the boundaries are in yellow and then the red stars represent the communities. So the, this isn't an, an exact you know, definition, there's no exact, but it's generally, the Eudora area is generally defined by the boundaries of the Eudora Township the boundaries of the Eudora School District, the Eudora Post Office Delivery Area, as well as homes and businesses who have their phone number start with 542. Uh, as you can tell, the Eudora area extends beyond Douglas County into Johnson and Leavenworth counties. And all five of these smaller communities in the Eudora area have a close connection to Eudora. And as you will find out tonight, all of these communities have their own unique histories. All of these communities have their own distinctive uh, personalities. Tonight, I will present on the history of Fall Leaf and Hesper, Steve Nice will present on the history of Weaver and Prairie Center, and John Moore will present on the history of Clearfield. I will now start with Fall Leaf. So Fall Leaf is located in Leavenworth County, just a few miles across the river from Eudora. Fall Leaf residents have historically had close connections to Eudora. So the source material for my presentation is largely from Eudora Community Heritage of our Bicentennial 1977 and City of Eudora Sesquicentennial Edition. Uh, by Cindy Higgins, and Fall Leaf by Lorraine Cox. Fall Leaf was established in 1865. Before Fall Leaf was established, the region was home to the Delaware Native American tribe from the 1820s until the 1860s. The Delaware tribe, who were from New York originally, they lived actually on Manhattan Island when the Dutch colonists first arrived there in 1624. They were native to the East Coast. Uh, they kept getting pushed further and further west, and by the 1820s they ended up in Kansas, of course, this process of forcibly removing Native Americans has been called the Trail of Tears. That's how the Delawares ended up here in, in Kansas. And we do have some Delaware artifacts on display in our museum. These were found by Lorraine Cox and her family. Uh, and they include uh, some fragment, pottery fragments, which were probably from the Delaware tribe, but then there's also a bunch of other arrowheads she found on her property, which of course probably predate the uh, Delaware tribe by hundreds, if not thousands of years, some of them. Um, and then uh, there's also part of a bowl fragment from uh, what, what they believe was the Delaware tribe because they knew where there was a, a Delaware campsite on their property. Uh, Fall Leaf was named after uh, this guy, Captain Fall Leaf. Uh, he was a leader in the Delaware tribe here in Kansas. And the uh, Fall Leaf community was established by the Kansas Pacific Railroad because, quote, the railroad needed a stop between Kansas City and Lawrence. The railroad station was named after Fall Leaf, as I just said. Uh, he lived here in Kansas, but he's buried in Dewey, Oklahoma. Ovid Snyder wrote about the depot, which later moved to Linwood, and said it had a waiting room on one end and a freight department on the other end. Its telegraph equipment was in a space protruding from the building so that the track could be seen. Uh, to get to Lawrence from Fall Leaf, Sophia Luckin, born in 1868 in Fall Leaf, said people had to follow a trail fording the Mud Creek across the Kansas River on the ferry. Uh, Sophia also remembered Delaware coming to her parents' home to barter for food and horses. The Luckin family came from Germany. August Luckin, born, March, born in March of 1825, came with his two nephews, Paul and Fritz, in 1864 to the United States. Narrowly, narrowly missing an iceberg on their six-week voyage, they first settled in St. Joseph and then bought their Fall Leaf Farm in 1865. Uh, of course, the other Delaware, I skipped over this, the other Delaware uh, legacy in Fall Leaf is the Delaware Cemetery, which is uh, just outside of Fall Leaf. And that cemetery was placed on the National Register in 2020. And here's a map of Fall Leaf to give you an idea. Uh, this is from 1903. <clears throat> and so it is just over the, the river from Eudora. And there's really not much left, but um, the, the railroad does still go through the area. And there's still a couple of buildings. So but um, it's obviously still in the general vicinity. Uh, five years after its founding, Andrew Bauer operated a steam saw and gerst mill on a spring-fed creek west of Fall Leaf. The community also supported a coal operation, blacksmith shop, stockyards, and a general store in which a post office was located. The first postmaster was John J. Weber, and George Bauer later held the position. 
In 1907, fire demolished the store with the post office. A Mr. Eubanks was a merchant there from 1910, and George Vale had a grocery store as well at the time. The store closed late in 1930, or in the early 1940s. The post office closed in 1928, and then reopened under the name Fall. One of the most notorious local murders happened in Fall Leaf in 1896, when Anna Lamborn, 27, along with her brother Charles, and friend Thomas Davenport, 23, were accused of hacking her father, William Lamborn, 85, to death with an axe. Anna said that she and Davenport had been at a dance till late, and she found her slain father when she awoke the next morning in their home, one mile north of Fall Leaf Railroad Depot. Arrested and tried for a murder most atrocious, months later, 70 witnesses helped Anna, Charles, and Davenport be found innocent. Weeks later, Anna married Davenport. Another murder occurred in 1918. Carl Corner shot George Vale, 52, in the back on a Saturday night after gathering at a general store owned by Seth Kindred. <clears throat> Vale's son-in-law. Vale had been walking home from the store and after a shot was heard, found along a path. Corner had robbed Vale in the past but had not been fined or sentenced to jail because he was a minor. Sentenced to six years in prison, he was paroled in 1923. A few years later, he was arrested again for the robbery of a Lawrence grocery store. In 1910, Fall Leaf had a post office, express and telegraph offices, and a population of 43. The rich river bottom land near Fall Leaf produced various crops, including potatoes, melons, alfalfa, corn, and wheat, said Laureen Cox. During the 1920s and into the 1940s, farmers also grew peas that were shelled at the pea vinery east of Fall Leaf, sent by train to Lawrence, and sold in the cannery there. However, the river's floods of 1903, 1908, 1951, in 1993, destroyed crops and eroded the banks of the Kansas River, bringing the river closer to what is now left of the town. The floods, as well as the general trend of people moving out of rural settlements, led to the decline of Fall Leaf population-wise throughout the 20th century. The first schoolhouse in Fall Leaf was made out of wood in late 1865. Anna Sophia Luckin said in a 1947 Lawrence Journal World newspaper article that after grasshoppers had ruined crops, the schoolhouse was used as a distribution point for food collected by the eastern states and sent to the Leavenworth station. The Fall Leaf men met the train with the wagons and, and, and brought the supplies to the school. The Fall Leaf school later consisted of a brick building. Uh, this, this shows uh, the Fall Leaf school as it looked in 1899. It's my understanding that building burned down in 1909. And then they built the brick building, which still is there today, after that building burned down. So that, that building held classes in Fall Leaf until 1953 after which Fall Leaf students attended schools in Linwood, but later attended Edora schools. And the old Fall Leaf school building, which sat vacant for many years, was recently rehabilitated by Don and Diane Huggins, and they currently live in the building. In uh, recent years, Operation Wildlife, which is on Guthrie Road, has been a well-known location in the Fall Leaf area. Its director, Diane Johnson, leads 50 volunteers who care for wild animals who need medical attention. The facility cares for about 2,000 animals each year before releasing them to the wild. So that is Fall Leaf. Uh, the next community is Hesper. Hesper is one of the oldest communities in Kansas. It's located about two miles directly south of Eudora, near the intersections of North 1100 Road and East 2300 Road. And again, the source material for this, uh, for this portion on Hesper is the Eudora Community Heritage of our Bicentennial, the City of Eudora's Sesquicentennial Edition, and Hesper by Violet Gerstenberger Fleming. Hesper was first established by staunchly anti-slavery Quakers in the 1850s. Across the U.S., Quakers were known for their abolitionism or opposition to slavery. The Quakers that settled Hesper moved to Kansas to help stop slavery from spreading into Kansas from Missouri. The Kansas Free State, on June 4, 1855, reported that a disease re resembling, resembling cholera carried off three very interesting young Indians who were attending school at the Friends Mission in Hesper, which indicates a school and settlement in Hesper. However, typically the first Quakers credited for settling the Hesper area were Jonathan and Phoebe Mendenhall, who arrived in a covered wagon in 1858 from Indiana. The Mendenhalls, who held worship services in their home one mile east of Hesper, donated their land to the Springfield Monthly Meeting for Church and Cemetery. The uh, Hesper Church was originally known as the Springfield Monthly uh, Meeting. Uh, members hauled a 24, 20, 24 square foot lumber meeting house from Leavenworth for the services observed by silent worship until someone was moved to testify, preach
preacher pray. However, some say that Sarah and Levi Woodard arrived first, and the name of their farm Hesper. They named their farm Hesper because, uh, because the word Hesper itself derives from the name of the Greek god Hesperus, who led the stars out at night. The Hesper Lyceum Society, organized in Hesper in 1859, included Captain Jennings, O.G. Richards, Nathan Henshaw, Sarah Woodard, and Mrs. Sanford. Members would gather on Friday nights to hear speakers and read essays. The uh, first school in Hesper started uh, in 1859 in a log cabin. Just south of the school, the, the Hadley brothers set up a general store in 1860 on the northeast corner of Section 28. The John Hill family came to Hesper in 1863 from North Carolina, followed by families from the same state. The following year, a second school, this one of stone, was built, and Oliver Butler opened his blacksmith shop in Hesper. A post office was established at a general store in 1870, and the Springfield Library with books donated by Joseph Peace. After the Grasshopper Plague in 1874, in hard winter, many people returned to the eastern states in 1875. The, uh, Lindemund family, who had come to the early, who had come here in the early 1870s, went to California, and then to go back a little bit, the uh, the Hesper Friends Quaker Church building, which still stands today, was first built in 1881 for $1,700, and through the years gained a basement and siding. The Springfield Monthly Meeting was renamed Hesper Monthly Meeting in 1883. The next year, the Hesper Academy became the first accredited high school in the Eudora area. The Hesper Academy was the only high school for <clears throat> option for many local families. However, when the Eudora School District opened its first high school in 1903, the Hesper Academy really couldn't compete with the public school, and it closed in 1914. In 1887, there were about 100 people living in Hesper, with two stores, a blacksmith, a post office, church, school, the Hesper Academy, and of course the Hesper Cemetery. There were about 24 homes in the area. The mail was carried from Leavenworth to Hesper by Arnold Hadley once a week. The service was to the post op the service was to the post office and the grocery store, but improved as the post office at Hesper was officially established by the U U.S. Postal Service, and mail was delivered there three times a week. Hesper even had its own newspaper, the Hesperian Rustic, edited by Dr. Woodhull, with community, state, and national news. As the 20th century started, uh, rural mail delivery began, and the first telephone line linked Hesper to the outside world. The Hesper General Store was bought and sold by a variety of people. In 1910, a slaughterhouse was in operation in Hesper. One of the more popular clubs in the Hesper area was called the Keystone Corner Club. Keystone Corner uh, is the name that is given to the intersection at North 1100 Road and East 2200 Road. Uh, the, uh, the house on the right still stands. That was the house that belonged to Captain Jennings. And of course, the Harris House, unfortunately, was demolished uh, very recently. But anyway, the Keystone Corner was likely given its name because several of the families that lived in that vicinity were from Pennsylvania, the Keystone State. The Hesper School was a two-room schoolhouse that served area children. The Hesper stage curtain from the Hesper School is now on display at the Eudora Community Museum on our second story, which that curtain's from about 1938, we think. Uh, Jim Harris found that curtain at a, uh, an estate sale. I think he paid like $300 for it. Uh, and, of course, he very generously gave it to the museum, and I think we've had it for only for almost 20 years now, so we've had it for quite a long time. The, uh, the Hesper School District merged into the Eudora School District in 1946. <clears throat> Sadly, the, the building that you see there was demolished in 1969. Uh, the federal government announced in 1966 that it had six probable sites for a $375 million atom smashing project. The region near Hesper was one of the six, but of course the project was not built here, it was built near Chicago. The population of Hesper gradually declined throughout the 20th century. However, Hesper remains, remains probably the largest of the Eudora area communities today. The Hesper Friends Church remains active. Many houses are still located in the Hesper area. And of course, several very notable people are from Hesper. One of them uh, is a man named James Davis. James Davis was a wealthy businessman originally from St. Louis. He lived in Hesper in the uh, 19th century. Davis later went on to establish Friends University in Wichita in 1898. The man uh, a lot of us know a lot about is also from Hesper. That's Walter Roscoe Stubbs. Uh, Stubbs was born in Indiana in 1858 and grew up in Hesper. He became a self-made millionaire as a railroad contractor in the 1890s. Stubbs then entered politics in the early 1900s. He was elected as governor of Kansas in 1908 and re-elected in 1910. 
Stubbs was a progressive Republican and championed pro progressive causes like voting rights for women, alcohol prohibition, and securities regulation. Stubbs was the Republican nominee for one of, for one of Kansas's Senate seats in 1912, but he lost the general election to Democrat William Thompson. After Stubbs's political career ended, he retired to his mansion in Lawrence, where he died in 1929. And I think his mansion is, uh, his old mansion is now a, a fraternity house uh, that's allegedly haunted, uh, which I don't think it is. They, there was this, docu this haunting documentary crew that came and talked to me about, I guess, uh, about Walter Stubbs a couple of years ago. It's on YouTube, but you know they came up with all these crazy stories about Governor Stubbs, like he had a mistress and his wife murdered his mistress or something, and now the mistress haunts the house. It's just nonsense, you know. No, no, no factual basis for any of this. So I felt like I had to defend Governor Stubbs's character in that interview because there's no proof for any of these things. Just urban myths. Another, another notable person from Hesper is John Outland. John Outland was born in Hesper in 1871. He was a, John Outland was a very talented athlete. He played football at the University of Pennsylvania and at the University of Kansas. Outland was a two-time All-American in football in 1897 and 1898. In the early 1900s, Outland spent several years acting as the head coach uh, at nearby universities in Douglas County, including Haskell, KU, and Washburn. Outland later established the Kansas Relays in 1923. Outland later obtained his medical degree and was a surgeon. Outland died in California in 1947. In 1974, Outland was inducted into the Kansas Sports Hall of Fame. 2001, he was inducted into the College Football Hall of Fame. And John Outland is the namesake of the Outland Trophy, an annual award established in 1946 and given to the best interior lineman in college football. It's the third oldest uh, trophy in college football. And that is Nakamakin Nek Sioux holding the Outland Trophy probably around the year 2010. Um, so Hesper does have a few notable people that live there. That's all I have on Hesper. I'll now turn it over to Steve Nice for Prairie Center and Weaver. All right, thank you, Ben. Um, let's start with Prairie Center here. I don't have very much of a family connection with that one, though, but I do Weaver, and I'm giving that one too after this. So. Prairie Center was first known as Barefoot or Bear Paw. It was located two and a half miles east of the Douglas Johnson County line on 135th Street in the Lexington Township. The exact date of when it was found is not really known, but it's more likely late 1850s, early 1860s. That's when the development really started around this area. In the early years of Prairie Center, the Oregon Trail could be have passed through the through it at times. The main part of the road went through the went through the west side of Prairie Center. The Prairie Center School District was founded in the late 1860s. The original building was built in 1921, or in the 1860s, and was replaced in 1922. There were a variety of businesses in Prairie Center. There was a creamery, a cider mill, a blacksmith shop, a hat shop, two general stores. One was operated by the Grange. The store building was jointly owned by the Grange and the Oddfellows. The Oddfellows owned the upstairs, and the upstairs of the building was used by the citizens for elections, community functions, and talent shows. Some of the talents included local singers, two Olathe businessmen singing humorous songs, and Frank Richardson, who lived in Prairie Center, would tell stories of Indian encounters in his younger years. He was also personally acquainted with Bill Cody, who later became known as Buffalo Bill. Prairie Center also had a doctor named Dr. Barnes, who had a doctor's office and drugstore. One of his medical suggestions was a bite of chewing tobacco after each meal ate a digestion. Probably not recommended this day and age anymore, but. <laughs> then Dr. J.J. Woodard was later another doctor and dentist in Prairie Center. He moved his practice to Olathe in 1916 and Prairie Center never had another resident doctor. Prairie Center had two churches, a Friends Church and a Methodist, Free Methodist Church. Both churches had camp meetings. The Friends had theirs at the Charles Gordon Grove on the Captain's Creek, the Methodist had theirs at the Charles Reed's Timber at Spoon Creek. The Charles Reed Farm later was sold to movie star Buddy Rogers and his wife Mary Pickford, along with Bert and B.H. Rogers, and it was called 3B Ranch. Buzz Buddy visited the farm from when he would come back to Olathe to visit, because that's where he grew up. And there, the media and the papers of the Times, they would take pictures of Mary Pickford gathering eggs and other rural activities. Buddy had 
a lot of relatives in the, well, also in the Hesper area and in Prairie Center. In 1942, the government condemned Prairie Center and the area around it was used for the Sunflower Ordnance Plant. The only building that still stands at the Prairie Center is the Friends Church, which, they moved, which was moved to Gardner. The government also bought, the, I'm sorry, but the, the government bought the church and the members had it moved. At first it was a mile and a half, or half a mile west and a mile and a half south of Prairie Center and then later was moved to Gardner. The only building still standing really in the whole Prairie Center area is the Dr. Roberts house in the lake. It's just right off of Evening Star uh, Terrace, I believe it is, that goes down, down to the cemetery now. And then the Prairie Center Cemetery is also there. And as of about a year or so ago now, the site that used to be Prairie Center was, it was all uh, annexed in by the city of DeSoto. And which button, the middle one? The big one. This was Edwin Rice. He's the one who where I got most of this information from. He was kind of about the only one who really wrote a lot about the whole Prairie Center area, and he was a longtime resident there. And Benny Dean he used to have this the position as our Prairie Center director. That was his father-in-law. And here he is also Gail Rice. That was Edwin's son there. This is 1934 with his uh, field truck. Here's a map of Prairie Center there. You can see a few of the owners on there. And this is a residence of Jesse and Barbara Moon, longtime residents from that area. The Prairie Center blacksmith shop, W.G. Rice, that was uh, Edwin's, his father. And also the two churches, the Methodist Church on the left and the Friends Church on the right. And there's the school, and then George Hennessy with one of his pet squirrels that was raised by a, his cat. <laughs> and then here's a map of the Roberts house, as you can see there. There's Evening Star Lane there, and then one of the access roads. And here's the cemetery, and that's really about all that's left. Never, never really had a real exciting history, very soon, but it, did, it definitely had an interesting one, when it, especially when it comes to the ending of the town being condemned and a plant being built there. Now, on to Weaver. Weaver was located a mile east and a mile north of Eudora, northeastern Douglas County. Several acres of Weaver Bottom also are in Johnson County. The Call River flows just to the west and north of Weaver. 1854 of the U.S. Congress gave each eligible Shawnee Indian man 200 acres of land and another 200 acres for each member of his family. The Shawnee owners were Matthew King, his wife Catherine, and children Susan Lee, James, George, and Sarah, James Big Knife, Elizabeth Rogers, a widow, and son George, Thomas Big Knife, Locus, Locus Pascal, his wife Elizabeth, and sons Louis and James, Charles Fish, and wife Mary, and children, Elijah, Margaret, John, and Sally, and Charles op operated a ferry across the river with his brother Pascal, familiar name to us all. At this time, Weaver Bottom was heavily forested shortly after Eudora was founded. The trees were starting to be cleared, and the land was used for farming. There were many black residents in this area at the time of, for Weaver, and they helped clear the land. And then in 1865, Henry Weaver bought 1,000 acres of the bottom. Henry Weaver was originally from Pennsylvania and had moved to Ohio in 1845. By 1875, most of the bottom was owned by a weaver. One of Henry's sons, John Weaver, taught school from 1866 through 1869. He also helped his father farm in the summertime. In 1876, John moved to Salina and then moved back to the Call Valley to farm his own land in 1878. He raised potatoes, produced produce and livestock. He also owned a stone crusher and the railroad used the rock for construction of the tracks. He later moved it to Lecompton in 1898. In 1892, John Weaver obtained a station from the Santa Fe Railroad with it being built on his farm. The name of it was in his honor. They named it Weaver. Both passenger and freight trains stopped in Weaver. It was said it cost 10 cents to ride the train from Eudora to Weaver. He also opened the general store and post office in the new town. 
John Weaver served as station agent for the Santa Fe at the Weaver Station from 1891 to 1899. He was also the postmaster. John Weaver was a charter member of the Potato Growers and Cooperative Dealers Association. He also received a patent on a potato sorter, which reduced manual labor for the farmers. Weaver ran for state representative in 1898. As a, he lost to the Republican, but he ran as a populist, but he only lost that one by eight votes. And at that time, this was very much a Republican area, so to lose by only eight votes was quite something then. In 1899, John Weaver and his family moved to Baldwin for the purpose of giving his children the advantage of ed education in the high school and Baker University. In 1894, Weaver School District number 86 was formed. John and his wife, Australia, deeded one acre of land for the school to be built. Before the formation of the Weaver District, Weaver was part of a school district in Johnson County. The Weaver School closed in 1938 and the students sent to Eudora. The last members of the Weaver School Board were Leslie Kindred, Gideon Nice, and Floyd Brars. Ten years later, in 1848, the Weaver School District con consolidated with Eudora to form the new Eudora number 89. Oscar Brars bought the school house and had it torn down. My great aunt, her name was Ermel Westerhouse Whaley, she wrote about some of her experiences with Eudora. She said she always enjoyed school at Weaver, especially the first teacher, Doug Harris. Her first teacher was Doug Harris. She wrote, the parents were heartbroken when Harris left. My, my other great great aunt, Mae Wilson Kohler, she said she had fond memories of the Weaver School and of Doug Harris. She wrote that, I always remember him holding me on his lap and pulling a tooth. I'd refuse my mother's offer, but felt shame to refuse his. She also remembered him driving his horse and buggy to school from Keystone Corner. Irma Whaley, she also wrote that in 1914, when her parents bought the farm that they had built, that her grandparents also had a house. They moved the old Weaver store and they lived in it. And that's where also my grandparents, they lived there, Carl and Rita Westerhouse, and then later my parents did after they married. Potatoes were the main crop in Weaver, with John Weaver being the first to raise them in Weaver Bottom. Buyers would come from the cities and buy the potatoes for their produce companies. After harvest, they would ship, be shipped to, by the farm, or by train. In 1930, the following farmers had potato crops in Weaver. Ben Nice had 55 acres, Gideon Nice had 55 acres, Carl Nice had 50 acres, Leslie Kindred had 35 acres, Walter Wilson, 25 acres, William Spitzley, 25 acres, George Boris, 20 acres, and John Bowen, 20 acres. There was not one spectacular event that ever took place in Weaver, and the population began to decline, especially after the 1903 flood. Then it continued after the 51 flood. There really wasn't, the town had pretty much been gone, but after that, nothing really more happened. In 1997, the federal government bought out the four remaining houses in Weaver and had them torn down, and no buildings are left in Weaver today. And we got a few pictures here. Here's a map, as you can see up there, the railroad running through there. And as you can see, it's also that most of the bottom at that time was owned by a Weaver. And here's a picture of John Weaver and his grave. He was buried over in DeSoto along with his, uh, his father, Henry. And and his parents and his wife was also apparently later john and his wife moved to oklahoma because they both passed away down there and then like i said we're buried in desoto well, here's one of the map Look. margaret gabriel got a lot of this information that's where i got most of this from she compiled a lot of that and here's the weaver schoolhouse in 1931 and here's the general store down there Another map there, some of the landowners. See Spitzley's and Wilson's, Brewer's, Westerhouse and Nice's. And here's the depot in 1918. And here's the old, this was John Weaver's house. Many of you I'm sure probably can remember this. This is where Delmer Spitzley used to keep his airplane in there <coughs> after the flood. This was the house that my great grandparents lived in and my grandparents and parents also this is one of the houses that remained until 97 when they tore them down 
This was Ben Nice's house, another one that was torn down then. Carl Nice's house, also it was torn down. Giddy Nice's farm. Those were the last houses that were left. All right. John, we will now do a presentation on Clearfield. These have been so scholarly that it's like, I don't know if I want to go ahead and um, have, have this much fun. Um, So this is Clearfield. Um, it was like I gave this, gave part of this presentation to a Chautauqua earlier this year, and so now I'm, I extended it, and I've been helping at the Clearfield School for since 2006, and so I've gotten some a lot of fun. Um, information about it um, and I'm making this a fun presentation so um, but you must I must apologize that I do use a lot of anglicized words um, so um, I'm reaching back a little bit more into um, prehistory in this uh, so quickly Clearfield is earliest known as um, the big one. Big one. Okay. Clearfield is earliest known as Captain's Creek or Captain Creek by Jacob Fowler in a memoir in 1822. Um, because by the time that, or which means that it probably got located by. Um, when Pike and, Long, and Stephen Long came through even earlier that they knew that Captain Creek came down and we've seen it in Weaver and in Prey Center um, but Captain Creek went farther south and so um, it was first mentioned by Jacob Fowler 1822 but it also was named by George Sibley when he surveyed the Santa Fe Trail in 1825 um, he said, Hungary was 62 miles from Fort Osage. Um, so that, that's at the edge of, our, of that history. But I'm going to move even um, farther back, some, a few years prior to that, a few years when Mount Oriad was at the edge of the Ice Valley. Um, and so, you know, at that point of time, um, the ice sheet can't got all the way down to the Call Valley, so I don't know why my feet feel so cold right now. But um, but Clearfield was nice and warm um, at the edge. There, if you ever go down to um, to about 700 Road, you will find some posts with red rocks on it, and sort of like the um, in Yuhavi, Wahaba that is being moved right now. Um, some of those red rocks made it to the edge of the um, valley down there. As you can see, I'm asking why Bullwinkle um, through all of this. So um, I think some of you can relate to who Bullwinkle is without me telling. Um, Okay, so we even go from that point, it was several thousand years that the Paleolithic Americans were there, or have been crossing the ice bridge, and then it, we actually down towards Captain's Creek, there are some Clovis Lithic um, diggings that I know about, and then um, 
the plains archaic came were in the area, formative woodland, and a, sort of more recently, the Hopewell um, tribe was more in the Leavenworth area, but the Hopewell, Kansas City was around the time of Jesus to about 750 AD, or it's believed to be that, and there's artifacts down there. So this just gets you back, way back into understanding our area. And of course they were, um, all these were, or they started growing squash and marsh elder in this area. They were gathering seeds, nuts, deer, raccoon, turkey. And then that continued for a few hundred years until um, about what, um, what scientists believe um, about 1200 to 1400 when other Ohio Hopewell came back um, to this area um, and that included the Kansas, the Iowa, the Missouri, the Osage and they were not necessarily all that kind of people. They were known for their enslaving or killing and they came across the Missouri River. Okay, but of course, then we move a couple of hundred years and Spain, as we know, Coronado came up, but also along the Santa Fe Trail, there were, was Spanish traders coming across um, in the 1700s. And of course, the French were um, trading up in this area in those same ages. And that's um, Chateau, Choteau, who is common if you go up and down the Missouri River and the Kansas River, um, well known in this area. Um, but at, at about this time, the Kansas, set, Kansas and the Osage were still in the area. Well, there was a War of 1812, which a lot of the peoples fought with the British, fought, or fought on the side of the British, and that included some of the Shawnee and the Lenape um, or Delaware. Um, and so about it, from that, they were migrated in around 1833 um, from their home places on the Ohio, uh, Ohio River in Pennsylvania, and they were moved here. And so we know about the Delaware and the Shawnee being here with, um, with Paschal Fish. Okay, and so, um, and some of the Shawnee, about 20 of them, reserved about their 100 acres each on the Captain Creek down in the Clearfield area, but they were removed about 1858. Okay, so in 1856, um, Peter Brickheisen and Frederick Brydock came bringing bring the idea of having all people equal to pledge allegiance to the principles of independence and regulated by the Constitution with God, given rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And by 1878, um, John Glazer became postmaster of the town of Clearfield, and he named it after his home in Clearfield, Pennsylvania, on the Chickalaka Moose River. Well, the anglicized Lenape meaning of Chickalaka moose means the large laughing moose. So in baby boomers terms, that's Bullwinkle. Um, and if you're a little bit younger, um, it, it's um, the Seattle's kill the moose or wh whoever their mascot is because they're, it, um, because no one liked the moose up in Seattle um, in the early days. But we also know that Brickheisen and Breidhoff were devout German ev evangel, evangel, evangel Union 
uh, members and services at the church were um, were in, in and it, this building was built in the 1860s, 1870s, and they um, had services in both German and English until about 1911, because they knew um, things were heating up in Europe at that point in time, and the older people were dying out, and the younger people were speaking English um, so much better. The church can, uh, right now struggles with memberships, but is active, um, is still active. The German, um, they had a German Christmas party um, every year up till 2019, at which time it was a big event and they couldn't present it anymore. Well, um, Breidhoff um, started in the role, it role um, Rollins started a school district um, about the 1850s and is one of the earliest school districts in Douglas County um, and it was in a log cabin in about 1870 uh, 1878 they built a frame building um, near where that log cabin was and then um, that was got that got to be about 100 students about the turn of the century, 1900. So they decided to build a bigger school, but they also planned to have kids um, go to school on the other side of Captain's Creek. Um, and so in 1903, the, um, they built a new building. And in 1908, as the, um, as the Pleasant Oak building got underway. Um, they moved the Queerfield School away from what, what was the Union School and they moved it three quarters of a mile up the hill um, to the current location of where it is. And, and so from that point they taught American excellence until its consolidation in 1949 to Eudora. Wellsville and Baldwin. Um, at that point in time, the building um, was bought by the Grange, and then a community building used, uh, uses were in it from that point of time. Well, in 1990, it, um, a historical society bought it, um, and in about 2011, um, we started it on the road to. Uh, um, National Registration, um, National Historical Register, which we got in 2014. And we are, tr are trying to keep it open at least a few times a year. Um, and so a few of the things that's going on even today, um, it typically would be on the Call Valley Tour, but this year it's under some construction, which I'm going um, under construction, a new bell tower is going up right now on it, and it won't be available for the Call Valley Tour, but um, we're hoping in a year. Um, and so, also right now in in the Call Valley, there's a Dancing Cows, um, long hair, um, Scottish cows are down the down in the valley um, by Captain's Creek, and. Er, um, two years ago, three years ago now, um, there has, with all this windmill and solar panels, this area was trying to congeal into a community, um, and so they've been um, been trying to unify, especially with these concerns. It's still there. It's small, but the it's an active. Our, we've got active neighbors down there um, earlier and several annual events whether and weekly events at the church or annual events whether it's Call Valley farm tour normally or actually we do have a annual Chautauqua that goes at a family's farm 
down there. So um, that is my quick presentation and there's a lot of references that came through these this but um, for the most part it's my experience with Clearfield and just I wanted it to be a fun presentation because um, quite often we've got this big history and trying to relate to it all can be um, great so you're always welcome to Clearfield. Thank you.